Here's an apologist going on a rant about atheism. Atheism lacks appeal. It just seems so unintelligible, close-minded, and dismissive toward 95% of humanity that fails to believe in a godless universe. That's not to say all atheists emit these unsavory traits, but in large part, atheism packages itself as brilliant, enlightened, and unshackled from petty beliefs about all things supernatural. There is a type of intellectual hubris that hitches itself to this worldview I can't ignore. Think about what adherents of atheism are left to deny. The atheist must deny every account of miracles, every account of people's so-called religious experience, every account of answered prayer, every account of supernatural healing, and every account of divine providence. Now that takes a serious dose of chutzpah to deny all this in the name of delusion. That's what's unintelligible. That's what's absurd. That's what's delusional. I can't deny it. To summarize, not only is atheism delusional and absurd, but it's uniquely dismissive and arrogant given that most people have historically had supernatural beliefs, and there are lots of reports of miracles, unanswered prayer, religious experiences, etc. that atheists have to discount. The first thing to point out is that whether any of his points have any initial plausibility at all will depend on what kind of atheism we're talking about. In his SCP article on atheism and agnosticism, Paul Draper draws attention to the distinction between local atheism and global atheism, the former being more limited limited in scope and applying to one kind of god. For example, in philosophy of religion, the term god is often defined in relation to the traditional omni-god of major religions. Or, you know, as an orthodoxly conceived monotheistic god, more generally. I really like that phrase. Maybe I should use it over a thousand times. If you know, you know. Anyway. Being an atheist with respect to this prominent conception of God, it doesn't entail rejecting spooky stuff or even the existence of the supernatural. And so his criticisms wouldn't apply to the kinds of local atheists more sympathetic to Wu. Second, I don't think that a naturalist position that doesn't have room for gods and its ontology is uniquely arrogant, so to speak. I mean, let's consider Bobby's version of evangelical Christianity, for example. It says in the bio on his website that he teaches courses at Calvary Chapel Bible College, an institution that affirms the Chicago Statement of Biblical Inerrancy. People who affirm this have to deny the existence of every Bible contradiction, every truly immoral passage, every historical inaccuracy, every conflicting theological framework between authors, every failed prophecy. There is literally no good reason to affirm this kind of position on the Bible independent of needing it to be true to protect a theological framework, unless you're just trying to Jesus juke it into respectability because you think it's entailed by the resurrection. The institution also affirms, quote, those who do not personally trust in and receive the saving work of Christ by faith will be forever separated from God in an everlasting conscious state of torment. End quote. Long story short, the irony of an evangelical claiming that atheism is arrogant and dismissive shouldn't be lost on anyone. To actually address the claims he made, though, I'm going to be arguing that not only should naturalistically inclined atheists not be deeply disturbed by the points he raises, but actually each one undermines the kind of god he actually believes in. First is the fact that there exists a widespread belief in godlike beings, and that we seem to have inherent religious proclivities. Additionally, some people report having religious experiences. But how strong of a point should this really be against the atheist? There are plausible ways to explain the origins and persistence of religion on a large scale that don't require us to begin from the starting point that any of them are true, which is significant. We might appeal to a combination of factors like hypersensitive agency detection, or terror management theory, or cognitive dissonance, for starters. Further, there is very little reason to look at the religious chaos we see around us and think that's a good reason to believe in an all-powerful, all-knowing, and perfectly good being. There is widespread disagreement about which god or gods exist, which religion is true, and about how to attain salvation, however conceived. Further, as Felipe Leon puts it, quote, there is significant evidence from the scientific study of religion that, due to their cognitive architecture and other factors, people have a strong natural tendency to believe in and worship anthropomorphic deities. But if the god of theism exists, then he does not want us to be idolatrous. It's therefore surprising on theism that we have such an inclination." End quote. Yeah. Definitely seems like a being that encompasses goodness, knowledge, and power in a greater capacity than we can even imagine is in charge of things. Totally. Getting into the topic of religious experiences more specifically. Went home that night and I found a New Testament and I began to read it for the first time. And as I did, I was absolutely captivated by the person of Jesus of Nazareth. There was a ring of truth about this man's teachings that was undeniable. I just came to the end of my rope and cried out to God one night. And as I cried out all the anger and the bitterness that was in me, 
I felt this tremendous infusion of joy, like a balloon. When I was 14 and prayed about the Book of Mormon, before I could even get the words out, I just felt the Spirit in my heart just really strong, and, and I just felt so filled with light. It's confirmed to me in my heart that these things are true, and so. Supplication, Allah help me, guide me, guide me to the truth. If you guide me to the truth, I'll never leave it. And I knew in my heart, Allah was telling me in my heart that Islam, this is, this, this is true, you know? And I knew right there it was the correct religion. I just don't see why anyone who doesn't already believe this stuff should be bothered by this. Especially if they've had similar experiences and concluded that a god wasn't what was causing them. And even if we granted that such things could count as some evidence for the person experiencing them, it doesn't follow that anyone else needs to lose any sleep over it. Now for answered prayer and divine providence. Today, a man lost his car key on a ski slope. He'd look for it, but come on, you can't find a lost key in the snow on the side of a mountain. Because that's impossible. Then, I sensed a strong certainty that God wanted me to pray with him and for us to ask God to help us. I felt hesitant to pray. I mean, it felt silly. What if I ask God and we don't find it? But I was certain God wanted us to pray. So we prayed, God, you know where this key is. Please help us find it. You say we don't have because we don't ask. So we are asking. We said amen and went looking. No key. I didn't understand. Why do you ask us to pray? So we walked down the last leg of the slope and saw a black speck. We dug. It was the key. Y'all, a key. In the snow. On a mountain. Impossible. Except for a God who hears our prayer. Again, why should anyone that doesn't already believe take things like this seriously? And the fact that most claims about answered prayer and divine providence are indistinguishable from coincidence is surprising on the hypothesis that there's an intervening prayer-answering deity in charge of stuff. This leaves us with direct miracle reports. In case you didn't know, people are gullible. Additionally, if one, every second of your life in the world seems regular to you, two, your experience with the reliability of human testimony is hit or miss, and three, you correctly see that religious testimony specifically is extremely suspect, then people claiming things like, oh, I don't know, that a dead person came back to life by itself should not overturn that experience. Plus, the conflicting accounts of miracles supposedly corroborating the truth of different religions feeds into the problem of religious diversity for theism mentioned earlier. What's worse for Bobby, though, is that taking a skeptical approach to this kind of stuff isn't unique to atheism. And Theists could just as easily be wary as well. Prominent philosopher of religion, Yuja Nagasawa, who Bobby is apparently studying under, says, quote, I think reality is much broader than the realm governed by the laws of nature, which are only contingent, so in a sense I am a supernaturalist. Therefore, if we define a miracle as a violation of the laws of nature, then I believe that miracles can take place. However, I am not aware of any strong empirical evidence for specific miraculous acts, such as instantly turning water into wine or curing incurable diseases in a few seconds." End quote. Indeed, if I were a theist, I would take God's self-revelation through nature very seriously. He likes it regular. So I would pretty much be as skeptical about miracles as I am now if I were convinced that God exists. But alas, there are good reasons to doubt his existence. Tap here for an example. 